In part one of this video about Tel Dan, we took a tour and saw all the key places of this site. We also set the stage and talked about the historical background of Tel Dan so that you could better understand and really appreciate all the monumental and important things that took place here. In this video, we're going to talk about the important and sobering events that happened here from the Bible and wrap up with some vital faith lessons God has for us today from this biblical site. So I think you'll find this video very enlightening and transforming to your life. We are shooting this talk right in front of the altar here and the high place, so right here where the uh, steel is, that was the altar. And then up above that was a platform, and that is what uh, Jeroboam did. He built two altars with golden calves. One was in Bethel, which is south. That's kind of in the southern part of the northern tribes. And then in Tel Dan, he built this golden calf. Now what takes place here is pivotal because this is now going to be the beginning point, the first chapter in the downfall of the ten tribes of Israel and their eventual deportation. Now unfortunately, it was because of King Solomon that the nation became divided and fell into the worship of false gods. Scripture recounts how Solomon turned from the Lord in his latter years and introduced the worship of false gods into the nation. When you think of Scripture, I was talking to my good friend here, Dan, as we were, we were uh, traveling, who do you think would be the greatest failures in the Bible? Probably the number one would be Judas, betrays Christ. My pick for number second would be Solomon. Even though he wrote three books of the Bible, he wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. But what did Solomon do? Solomon in his latter years, and I'll just read this uh, phrase to you. It says in 1 Kings 11, 1 and 2, it says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love, scripture says. Then in 1 Kings eleven six it says, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemish, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and that would be the Mount of Olives, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. Now this is interesting. The God appeared to Solomon and warned him not to go after these other gods, yet he did not listen. And it says, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. And that servant would be Jeroboam and then Rehoboam would be Solomon's son who took the southern two tribes. So Rehoboam takes the southern two tribes of Israel, which are called Judah from this time forward, and Jeroboam received the northern ten tribes of Israel, which would be called Israel from this time forward. Now even though the kingdom of Israel was divided, God appeared to Jeroboam and promised to bless him if he would serve him. So in 1 Kings 11.38 it says, then it will be, and this is God now talking to Jeroboam, then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight, 
by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. So God is this gracious, merciful God. He's just always giving, not only us, but he's just always giving people second chances, okay? Now, if you'll follow me, I'll bless you. If you'll just get your act together, I will bless you. Do you think Jeroboam listens? This is what happens. First Kings 12, 25, it says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem, and we'll be going there in the hill country of Ephraim and live there. And he went from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David, meaning down to the southern part of Israel, to, the, to Judah, if this people go to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. When he says to their Lord, he's talking about Rehoboam in this situation, king of Judah. So Judah, once again, is now the name of the southern two tribes of Israel. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel. Israel's now the 10 northern tribes that brought you from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, we'll be going there, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the ones as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places and made priests from among the people who were not of the sons of Levi. It's according to the scripture, a priest could only come from the, the Levitical priesthood line, but he did not honor that. God warns him again. He's gonna come and give him another severe warning because he's doing this. He's gonna give him another chance, but do you think he listens? So it says in 1 Kings 13, 33, even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once more appointed priests for the high places from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and its destruction from the face of the earth. So God warns him, Jeroboam does not listen, and then this is the result, and this was the downfall then that led to, uh, as scripture says, its downfall and its destruction. So the summary of Jeroboam's life could be said that he chose to fear people instead of God, or he chose fear over faith. So Jeroboam was afraid that if he allowed the people to go to Jerusalem, that they would defect, that he might lose his life or whatever. So he said, in order to, to save himself, he was looking out for his own interest, he built two altars with golden calves. One was in Bethel, which is south. That's kind of in the southern part of the northern tribes. And then in Tel Dan, he built this golden calf. Okay, so you would probably have about half of the 10 tribes going to Bethel. You would have half of the 10 tribes coming up here. So there was a city here, it was called the city of Dan, and so it was a beautiful area, and we've walked through it as we've come up, plenty of water, and so the city of Dan serviced all of the, at least five tribes or maybe more that would come up here to worship. So in the same way in Jerusalem, there was the altar in front of the temple, and they would sacrifice at the altar, then they would be sacrificing to the true God in the temple. Here, they had an altar, but the sacrifices to were, were to this golden calf. And why was it a golden calf? Well, probably because when the Israelites came out of Egypt, and then they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, and Moses went up on the mountain, he was up there, what did Aaron do? He made a golden calf, okay? So Jeroboam said, these are your gods that led you out of Egypt. So therefore, they began to worship here. Now Jeroboam, it says in scripture, that the priesthood, he chose his own priest. 
he went totally against scripture, totally against God's word, and he set up his own form of religion. So there was the Levites, no Levites. The priest, they were not from the Levitical tribe. So he got his own priesthood and he just set it up and he worshiped here. Now the sin of Jeroboam became a pattern that the rest of the kings in Israel would follow. It says in 1 Kings 15, 33, in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha, son of Ahijah, became king of all Israel in Tirsa, and he reigned 24 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit. And you just see, if you read your Bible, you'll see repeatedly that these kings walked in the ways of Jeroboam. So now Jeroboam becomes the heir in a bad way of all the sin that continues to happen because all the seceding kings follow Jeroboam's pattern, which tells us that oftentimes what we do, we can set in our, whether it be our families, in our lineages, in our legacy, we can set patterns and we can cause damage to our lineage and we can be a blessing to our lineage. So what happens? The years roll by, so the kingdom became divided in about, let's say, 925 BC. 200 years later, now the Assyrians are gonna come in and they're gonna wipe out the nation of Israel, that's the 10 northern tribes, and they're gonna be deported to Assyria with just a few living in the land. 80 years later, as a result of reading the scriptures, Josiah became king of Judah and chose to follow God with all his heart. And he led one of the biggest revivals Israel ever experienced. I love Josiah. He became king when he was eight. His forefathers were wicked and he led one of the greatest revivals. It says this in 2 Kings 22.1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bosketh. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all his ways, in all of the ways of his father, not turning aside to the left or to the right. And it says in 2 Kings 23, 25, before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise afterward. Now it was Josiah, why do we mention Josiah? Because Josiah later on gained strength in the northern tribes. They begin to unite with him and he is the one who destroyed this altar right here. It says in 2 Kings 23, 15, furthermore, the altar that was at Bethel that was the one down south, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin, that he had made, even that altar and the high place he broke down. Then he demolished its stones, ground them to dust, and burned the Asherah. Asherah was the female goddess who was kind of the counterpart, you might say the wife of, in an understandable way, of Baal. So you had Baal, the masculine God, and Asher was like the female God. So it was Josiah, it says in 2 Kings 23, Josiah also removed all the houses of the high places which were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made provoking the Lord, and he did to them just as he had done in Bethel. So once again, in summary, Jeroboam sets up this altar and the golden calf was up there and then the altar was right here and they would sacrifice these animals to this false god the calf golden calf instead of the true and living god and so that became the downfall god warned jeroboam did not listen and so time goes on the nation does not repent and turn and so they're deported they're removed from their land and for a jew that was unbearable. That was, that was losing your heritage and your, and your identity. So, what are some faith lessons that we can learn from this city of Dan and especially this place right here? Well, despite God supernaturally revealing himself two times to Solomon, he turned away from the Lord in his latter years. 
He did well for most of his life. He had received a vision at Gibeon. God gave him supernatural wisdom, understanding. He blessed him. And Solomon walked with the Lord for many years. It says in scripture that he loved the Lord. But in his latter years, he turned away. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, and for those of us who have been Christians a while, sometimes it's easy in our latter years to fall away. In fact, scripture is filled with many examples of those who started well, but they ended poorly. So the lesson for us is, are we going to end well? And uh, the Apostle Paul, you know, sums it up wonderfully. He says, I fought the fight. He says, I finished the race. He describes the purpose of life. He says, I fought the good fight. And to get to the finish line, it's a fight. It takes every ounce you've got. There's, there's the, the forces of evil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We've got our sinful nature. We've got our culture around us. And it's a fight. In fact, scripture says that we have a war going on within us. We have the sinful nature. And so it's a fight. And to get to the finish line, it's going to be a battle. It's not going to be easy. So Paul says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. The race, that's your course of life. He says, I've done it. Is there anything more that you would want to say at your parting? I mean, that's it, isn't it? That's, that's what we're shooting for. I fought it. The good fight, I finish the race. And you're going to be tired at the end. So are we apathetic and lukewarm in our Christian lives, in our relationship with the Lord? Despite God supernaturally revealing himself two times to Jeroboam, he turned his back on God and built altars to false gods all throughout the land. Now God gives grace to each person to receive and obey him but to those who reject him, that grace will turn to judgment. The more grace we receive and we reject, the greater the judgment will be. So Jeroboam will have great judgment because he received grace. Solomon will have great judgment because he received much grace and then turn away from the Lord. The sin of Jeroboam, as we mentioned, became a pattern now for all of Israel. To follow and as we alluded to what kind of example are we what kind of example are we to our children uh, to our relatives in our circle of influence in our jobs in our churches uh, what kind of lineage uh, legacy so to speak are we leaving God says that I will visit the sins of the fathers to the second and third generation so the seeds that we plant will affect generations and, and we create in them default systems that take extra work to get out of so to speak so as we raise our children or in, have influence with our grandchildren whatever it might be it's vital that we walk in the ways of the Lord and teach them to do so so that they can have be effective instead of have being crippled with our sinful backgrounds we all have a story we all have backgrounds but for us, the question is, are we going to break those cycles? And we can. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We have all the grace we need to break those cycles. So we need to break those cycles and create new legacies. Now in 722, the northern ten tribes, as we mentioned, were deported. And for them that was tragic, and never would they return. Some have called them the ten lost tribes of Israel. Now, it's not true that they were all lost because there did remain in the country a few. The Assyrians were one of the most fiercest war machines that existed, and they were brutal. It says when they led them away, they led them away with rings in their noses. Just yank them. Many of them were tortured. Many of them were violated. Many of them were killed. And the slaves that went were just painfully treated. And that was the Assyrians. And when they fought, they purposefully were as mean and torturous as possible so that the other surrounding nations would see what would happen. They would say, you want to fight? Okay, you can surrender and save your life, or you can fight, and this is what's going to be your end. So they were fierce. They were mean. So they were deported, even though they had warning after warning after warning after warning. The prophet Elijah, the prophet Elisha, they ministered into this culture. 
they didn't listen. So they were judged. Now God is a God of mercy, but God is also a just God. And when a person rejects that grace, and, that, and God knows when the end's gonna be, when that person's, you know, won't receive or there's no hope for them, uh, God steps in. And eventually if a person, you know, rejects uh, God's grace through Christ, the rest of their life and they die in that state then obviously scripture says that they're going to go to the eternal lake of fire that's just a reality now the worship of these false gods here in Bethel and in Dan once again they became the downfall of the nation of Israel and they were false gods but I guess the question for us is you know they had this false god the Bible talks about false gods and idols those are anything that we place before the Lord I mean, a false god can be something that takes God's place, where he's no longer on the throne of our lives. And so we might have to ask ourselves a question, we should, what areas of my life do I have affections that are greater than, than God? What, uh, what might be my false gods? And then when I know them, will I be like Jeroboam and Solomon, or will I repent and give those up? And then we have the example of Josiah, who followed the Lord with all his heart. So what did he do? He tore him down. And it says there was no king like him. And like I say, uh, Josiah became king when he was eight years old. He didn't find the Bible until he was maybe 20 or so years old. It was found in the temple. And then the priest began to read it. And he just, he just repented in sackcloth and ashes. So Josiah, at eight years old, even though he had a bad lineage, God, the grace of God is sufficient, and he followed the Lord, he broke the cycle, and he tore this stuff down. So I guess for us then, uh, where are we going to fall? Each person, regardless of any place they are, no matter of what their background is, God's grace is more than sufficient to bring us out of where we've been. And so are we going to do that? And are we going to receive that grace? And for those that might be listening or watching by video, the question is, Am I going to respond to God's grace? Uh, but anyway, this right here, you're looking at the uh, downfall of the 10 tribes of Israel. And eventually the southern tribes would fall as well in 586 BC. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this time and I hope you've been challenged as well. Some great application for us today. And we find in scripture that these things were written beforehand for our example, that we might learn from them. So we see these examples, we see these principles that are applicable for us today. So thank you for your attentiveness and may God richly bless you as you seek to follow the Lord and, and leave a, a godly legacy.